my name is Gary. Obviously, I'm one of the Rangers here, and I have been here for a ridiculously long amount of time. I started working here at Biscayne National Park in 1989, so it's been a long time, but it's my favorite place on the planet, and on days like this, you can look out there and kind of see why, huh? It's pretty good. So when I was a kid growing up here in South Florida, I spent a lot of time poking along the shoreline looking for the things that came washing in, especially on, uh, on Watson Island in uh, the northern part of, of Biscayne Bay. Folks, you're welcome to join us. We're just getting started here. So yeah, I would poke along the shorelines of Watson Island looking for the things that came washing in, and I started to collect some of those things. And I don't know at what point I decided this, but I started calling them my gifts from the sea. I started collecting those up, and I didn't know anything about Anne Morrow Lindbergh writing a book by that same title at that point, but still called them my gifts from the sea. When you hear that phrase, gifts from the sea, what comes to mind? What do you think of? Shells? Yeah, almost always the very first answer I get is shells. So I always like to start with a shell. We're going to start with this one, which is a queen conch. If you want to sound like you're from South Florida, you got to say And uh, the name queen comes from all these little knobs on here that somebody thought looked like the, the crown that a queen would wear. But of course, a queen conch is a snail when it's alive. So when this snail was alive, it had one little eye stalk coming out there, one little eye stalk coming out there, and a tubular shaped mouth in the middle. And they kind of crawl along on the bottom. They wobble a lot, these queen conch. They're not real smooth moving like a lot of other snails are. But that's a big snail, right? And that's a lot of meat. And these snails became a major source of food for the people who lived on those islands that you could just barely see there, and for the people who lived on the islands across the Florida Straits from there, the Bahamas, a nation of 700 some odd islands. In fact, the people in the Bahamas and the Florida Keys ate so much conch that they themselves came to be called conchs. Are you going to Key West by chance? We we're coming from there. We You've been there. Yeah. So you probably saw the flags with the conch shell on them and signs that say the conch republic and things like that. So they are very much associated with the conch in many ways. But this particular, and, and the native people that lived here on these islands too, also had a great association with it. That island that's almost straight across where those few boats are about to pass each other over there, that's Sands Key. And on Sands Key, we have two very large mounds of shells out there, made largely of conch and whelk and things like that. So they're the garbage piles, right? The empty dinner containers from thousands of years of people out there. But this dinner container changed the time somebody cut the top off of it. Because when they do that, it changes it completely. No longer is it just an empty dinner container. Now, it's a mean of communication over long distances. And if you were one of the people who lived on these islands out here back in the 1700s, 1800s, um, you could have been involved in any number of industries. Maybe you were harvesting mahogany trees for furniture and shipbuilding. Maybe you were growing key limes and pineapples. Maybe you were hunting turtles. Maybe you were fishing. Maybe you were getting sponges. But there was one thing that everybody dropped everything for. Because when there was a shipwreck offshore, you knew you were about to get some pretty good gifts from the sea. And you knew you couldn't do it by yourself. Welcome. Thank you. you knew you couldn't do it by yourself. Because think about it, your boat is not very big. It's only about the size of the front porch section here. And you don't have a whole crew to operate it with. You operate it with your cousin or your brother or your son. And you knew that you might be out there for several days of work. So you'd have to get your supplies together. And once you got all of your supplies together, just before you pushed off from shore to go save as many lives as you could off that wreck and some other things that we'll talk about, you knew you couldn't do it alone even then. So you would let your friends and neighbors know what was going on. Now today, if you needed help with something, you might post on Facebook. Hey, I need a pickup truck this weekend. Anybody got one? Back then, they didn't have that, but they did have shell phones. 
<laughs> this is what it sounded like. That's a terrible song. Oh, I'm going to try it again. So you would get that idea, right? That sound would travel a really long distance. And everybody up and down those islands knew what that sound meant. Meant there was a wreck ashore, and soon you'd see all these little boats racing out to get there. Because the first one there was called the wreck master, and he was in charge. If he didn't like you, you were not allowed to be there. You get to go, you get to go, don't like you, you can't come. And that's the way the law worked. First order of business, as I said, was to save as many lives as you could. Next order of business was to save the cargo, because that's how you were going to get paid. Now, what was that cargo? There were barrels filled with fine china. There were barrels filled with silks. There were pianos. There were boxes and boxes of Edwin Clapp shoes and Queen quality shoes for the ladies. There was an iron bridge. All these things were wrecked out here on these reefs out here. Tons and tons of stuff washing in out there. They would take that, harvest it, get it onto their ships, and then they would take it in to Key West, or maybe Indian Key, and argue their case before the judge. You would go into that courtroom and you would say, Judge, it happened at night. It was so dark. I couldn't see what I was doing. There were no, there was no moon. There was no stars. I had to stick a lantern in my feet. It was so hard to do. And the judge would give you a larger portion of the goods as a result. Judge. It was so stormy out there, I couldn't even stand on the deck of the boat. And the judge would give you a larger portion of the good. Judge, I'll give you 20% of everything I took <laughs> off the boat. And the judge would give you a larger portion of the good. It was a highly corrupt industry. It made Key West the wealthiest city per capita in the United States for many years running, far exceeding New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, St. Louis, all the biggies that we think of. Key West on a per capita basis, wealthiest of them all. And it all started with the sound of a conch shell. So, sometimes though, the things that wash in on our shorelines are things that washed in precisely because that is the whole reason they went in the water in the first place. The whole reason was that they would wash in somewhere else. And that is the story of this thing. Anybody know what that is? Mangrove seed. Close. So close. Mangrove seed was the answer. And it is very, very close. We're just missing four letters at the end there. What do you call a seed that has already sprouted? A seedling. So this is a seedling from a red mangrove. Now, um, I'm going to guess you guys are from New Jersey originally. You have apple trees in New Jersey? Have you ever seen apples on an apple tree? Yeah. Yeah. What's inside of an apple? Seeds. Seeds. So imagine this scenario. Suppose that apple tree, full of apples that have seeds inside, those seeds start sprouting and start growing while they are still inside the apple, still hanging on the tree, and you have little tiny apple trees coming out the sides of the apple. That makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> that does not happen. With the mangroves, though, that is what's happening. The fruit on the red mangrove is about the size of my pinky tip there. It's got a single seed inside. That seed sprouts and starts to grow while it is still attached to the tree, still inside the fruit. It breaks through the bottom of the fruit, and it gets longer and longer and longer and longer until the whole tree is dangling with these things. And then a breeze comes along, or a bird lands on top, and that pointed end goes straight down into the mud, the roots come out, the leaves come out, and you have a whole new tree started. A tree that plants its own offspring is pretty cool. Downside, of course, kids are at your feet for the rest of your life. <laughs> now, if the water's too deep, or it hits a rock, tide is high, whatever, it's gonna float. It's not gonna plant itself, so it'll float. And it's gonna float for maybe up to a year. If it floats way out to sea, it's still gonna float this way because red mangroves don't take in any salt water. They only take in fresh water. 
and all that out there is lots of salty stuff. But if it gets close to shore, where in an ideal situation, not in South Florida anymore, there's fresh water coming off the mainland, that fresh water coming off the mainland starts to get soaked up in here and it starts to tip upright. That thicker end soaks up more than the thinner end. And maybe, just maybe, it'll get into an area where it works its way in and starts to grow again. So two chances. Still, there are tens of millions of bees going into the water and very few actually turn into a tree, right? Some of us have one kid and take really good care. Others have tons and tons of kids and we really don't care what happens to them. That's the story of the mangroves and lots of other animals. So that is not a seed. It's technically called a propagule. <laughs> that is not a seed, but we do get an awful lot of seeds that come washing in. And by the way, you are probably going to end, I should have started it this way, but um, you're probably going to end up with all that stuff. Just put it on the bench next okay. to you, the floor next to you. Don't need to you. Need to, don't need to worry about getting it up to me. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll, prom I'll try to remember to pass it around this way so you don't have to get up anymore. I'm fine. Thank you. There are seeds that come washing in, and these are some of my favorite things to find. Perhaps not this one, but it's illustrative. If you saw that lying on the beach next to you, you probably would think that somebody ate a nasty old peach the day before and left the pit behind, right? Um, but when it comes around, take it and shake it. You'll hear it rattles in there. And if you were to crack it open and look inside, it would look and taste just like the almond in the blue diamond can at the grocery store. This is a West Indian almond. And the idea that the plant has, if you could say that plants have ideas, is that this is gonna fall into the water, float off to a new location, and start growing over there. So it's a way of dispersing your seeds. The upside, as opposed to the red mangrove, then of course the kids are out of the house as quickly as possible, and you don't have to pay for college, you go off and retire and have a great life. Uh, so there you go. That is the West Indian almond. Not particularly attractive, but some of the seeds that come in are pretty interesting. For example, this one. This one is oval and covered in all kinds of little bubbles or blisters, and that gives it its common name, a blister pod. And blister pod has another name. It has several names. Some of them are rather crude, but uh, this one has a very interesting scientific name. You know those names that kind of make your eyes glaze over because they're so complicated? This one has a great one. This is Sacoglottis amazonica. Where is it coming from? All the way from the Amazon and Orinoco River Valleys in South America. So traveling really, really long distances here. Sacoglottis amazonica. Now this one has a name that uh, if you've just had lunch, maybe you're not so excited about, but if you haven't had lunch yet, maybe you're thinking about this little tiny version of a hamburger. hamburger. Oh, this is the hamburger sea bean. Um, this one might be a cheeseburger because I'm seeing some well done meat and a piece of Swiss top and bottom, a nice toasty brown bun there. This comes from... Uh, Pantropical areas. So all the way around the equator, you'll find species of these. And uh, they fall into the water and come washing in here too, all the way from South America. And these are, are often polished up and drilled and made into jewelry and things like that. This one has a very distinctive shape as well. A little bit of a depression right in the top there, a little notch, if you will. And that reminds some people of what? This is the sea heart. And the sea heart comes from the largest legume in the world. You know what a legume is, right? Like a bean or a pea. So this is the pea. The pod is about six feet long. And it grows in the tippy tops of the Amazon rainforest on a vine called the monkey ladder vine. If Tarzan had lived in South America instead of Africa, he would have been swinging on this vine, I'm sure. When those pods open up, these come raining down to the forest floor and they land there and they sit there in the forest floor in the rainforest until what happens in a rainforest? Rain. 
It rains. <laughs> it rains. Some, some of my questions are super easy. Don't <laughs> overestimate. Um, it rains, and it rains a lot. And when that happens, that river swells up into the forest, floods the entire forest, and these things come floating down and get caught in that light current, washing all the way out to sea, washing in here in South Florida, washing in in the Carolinas. These have been found in Scotland, Ireland, England, Portugal. In the Portuguese islands of the Azores, off of Africa, when they find these, they have a special name for it. It's called Fava de Colombo, which is the Columbus bean, because they say Christopher Columbus found one of these as a young man and said, hey, where did that come from? Set off looking a few years later. People would often cut them crosswise, make it into a little box, little locket for a photograph maybe, or a snuff box. People who spend a lot of time on boats will often carry these with them. The idea being that if this had traveled so far and you land, and it landed safely on shore, if you carry one with you, you too will land safely wherever you are going. These are often given as gifts to somebody going away on a trip or a journey, things like that. So I personally have carried one in my pocket for many, many years. Not necessarily this one, but for a variety of reasons. But you know what I do with it mostly? <coughs> Excuse me. This right here. I roll it around in my hand. It's my little worry stone or whatever you want to call it, right? Probably about 20, 25 years ago, I was sitting on the couch watching television with my dad this time of year, and I noticed that he kept glancing over at me as I'm doing this. What is a son for if he doesn't drive his father crazy, right? So I keep doing it, knowing that I'm annoying him. <laughs> and finally, he says, what are you doing over there? It's driving me crazy. And, uh, and I tell him the story of the sea heart as I have you today. And he says, let me see that thing. He takes it, and I see his wheels spinning. He's looking it over, and he says, you know, my father used to carry one of those. And as I told you, my father, my grandfather was from, uh, from City Island. And uh, I never knew him. He was 72 when my father was born, believe it or not. I never knew my grandfather, but suddenly I had a really cool connection to him. And so I've had one in my pocket ever since. These things generally are referred to as sea beans or drift seeds. And if you want to learn more about them, of course, you're nobody till you're somebody.com, right? Um, and so there is seabean.com where you can learn more about it. If you really, really get into it, come back to Florida next October. Cocoa Beach, Florida, the annual Sea Bean Symposium is happening there every uh, October. And if you really, really, really get into it, stick around till Sunday morning of the Sea Bean Symposium because that's the bean upon. <laughs> and everybody goes out to a certain stretch of beach and you're given three hours to find as many different species of sea beans as you can. In the year I went, I was so excited when I found 17, 18 species and I go back to the Cocoa Beach Library and I show what I have and stupid Peter Zeese comes in with like 32 species. <laughs> stupid Peter Zeese wins every single year. Anyway, sea beans. Unfortunately, not everything that washes in on Biscayne National Park shoreline is nifty, neat, and cool. I promise there is nothing in this bag that will hurt you in any way, shape, or form. So simply plunge your hand deep inside and grab something from the magic bag. <laughs> These are all items that were found out on Elliot Key, or Adams Key, or Boca Chita Key. Islands here in Biscayne National Park. And every one of these items has on it a clue that will tell you where in the world it came from. And while you look for your clue, I'm going to share some of my favorite things that didn't get pulled from the bag here. Let's see what we have. I'll pull out something different here and something different here. How's this? So, I have here some... Um, Looks like kitchen <laughs> polish from Korea, I believe. Yeah. If the only the only uh, Western letters on here are LG, so I think that's the LG Corporation and their their um, stove cleaner. We have um, some sunscreen from France here. 
we have some dandruff shampoo from Hamburg, Germany, and we have some deodorant from Havana, Cuba. What do you have? Save, save that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start here. I have a reason. The bathroom cleaner from China. Chinese bathroom cleaner, indicated by the pictures there. What else do you have? Look at the bottom there, and you can probably tell where it's from. You're fine. Join us. Yeah, what about down over here? What are the last words there? So we have some cola from San Jose, Costa Rica here. Wait, we got new people. I'm not going to let them get out of this, so I'm going to give you uh, Here, well, give... Oh, we got three people. There you go. Your job is to look at that and see if you can figure out where in the world it came from while we continue back here. What do you got, sir? I am air freshener from England. We have some lemon-scented English air freshener here. What do you have? I have some toilet bowl cleaner from Singapore. We have some Singaporean toilet bowl cleaner here. Um, let's give them a little more time to look. What do you have? It's an interesting one. It's a, it's a clear bottle. We'll let you guess what might have been in the clear bottle. Don't you guess the vodka? Probably. From where? Crimea in the Ukraine. Which is interesting because there's a certain somebody who says Crimea is not in the Ukraine, but we're not going to talk about that jerk. Um, what do you have? I have a dent unito. Uh, this is this is gonna be fancy. Yeah, oh, this, this is this is in French here. This is from Cote d'Ivoire in uh, in Africa. So yeah. from the Ivory Coast, and what yeah. is it specifically? Lightning, lightning cream. I find this with disturbing oh, regularity. Oh, is that right? Multiple <laughs> multiple <laughs> packages of this skin lightening beauty cream from Africa, implying that you have to be a certain color to be beautiful, and that's just mess up in all kinds of ways. What do you have back there? I've got, uh, it says medicinal con triclosin, so it's some kind of uh, disinfecting something or other. Yeah, medicated powder. Can you tell where it's from? Yeah, I think Colombia. Colombia, South America, yes. What do you have? Uh, the shampoo and conditioner. Uh-huh. Uh, maybe from Thailand? No, Ta uh, Philippines. How do you know it says Philippines, isn't it? Is it or is that? I thought I saw it say Philippines. So it's a Johnson & Johnson product, polluting Johnson. all over the world. Um, <laughs> here we go, right here. What is the last word you see there? Oh, oh, farmer, farmer. Belgium? What? Belgium? Oh, Belgium. Yeah, so we have some <laughs> Belgian dandruff shampoo. And what do we have here? It is not sal. Anyone know what sal translates from? Salt. 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 And on the back it says, it's, it's very cryptic on this one, it says S-T-O-G-G-O-R-E-P-D-O-M. Santo Domingo, República Dominicana. Okay. So we have some Dominican table salt here. So think about this. Do you think all of these items came from those countries? Not directly. So they could, right? Because we saw that seeds travel really, really far. Most of this did not come directly. Where did they actually probably most likely come from? A boat. A ship or a boat, right? You're on the deck of your boat, you're putting on your deodorant, you run out of deodorant, it's time to throw it away, right? Where is a way? Have you ever been to a way? <laughs> I've been to a way. A way is right there on those islands because all of this stuff that people threw away was right there. There is no a way. It's all out there. So I use this as um, a rather shameless advertisement. 
for the International Coastal Cleanup, which happens all over the world every year in September, where people go out for a three hour period and pick up stuff. And that is not unusual. Here in Biscayne National Park, last year we had volunteers cleaning up all year long, and we picked up 70,000 pounds of plastic and marine debris washed in on our islands. 70,000 pounds of lightweight plastic. You can imagine how much that is. The International Coastal Cleanup is a little bit different. One person picks up trash, their partner used to be they wrote everything down. Now they put it into an app. And what that does is gives us some really interesting statistics. Anyone remember that game show? Family Feud. <laughs> it's time for the Family Feud. In terms of sheer numbers, what is the number one item picked up on shorelines around the world in a three hour period? Go. Plastic bottles. Plastic bottles comes in at number two on our list with 627,014. Plastic bags. Plastic bags comes in at number six on our list with 272,399. Aluminum cans. Beverage cans comes in at number nine on our list, 162,750. Shoes. Shoes is <laughs> not on our list. <laughs> Fishing net or fishing net. So I'm not going to give you one of these because you said fishing stuff because fishing stuff is generally not measured in terms of pieces. It is measured in terms of mileage of line and fishing line and rope and it's something like around the earth 17 times. I, I don't remember the number but um, yeah enormous amounts of that. What else? You count microplastic? So microplastics is not listed on here, but almost all of these things are going to break down into microplastics. So for those of you that might not know what microplastics are, kind of what the name sounds like, right? It's the tiny little things that break down. Those little things that look like fish eggs in the water that a fish will eat and swallow, and then you eat the fish, and you ingest those little tiny pieces of plastic. It's estimated, and I don't remember the time period, but it's estimated that human beings consume about a credit card's worth of plastic every month, year, I can't remember what it was, but it's a lot of, we're eating this stuff because we're consuming the things that you get. So yeah, no, no X on that, but that's a good one. Yeah, what else? I'll give you one hint. It's not number one, but I'll give you one hint. These statistics came from the year 2020, September of 2020. Mask. Yeah, Masks and gloves and things like that come in at number four on the list, 519,438. Still missing a bunch. Candy wrappers or something like that? So we will go to um, number three on our list, food wrappers, candy, chips, etc. 573,534 of those. Here's Styrofoam. Styrofoam. Um, I'm going to extrapolate a bit. Take out and takeaway containers. Yes. Number eight on our list, 222,289. Amazon packaging? Amazon <laughs> packaging. Good answer. Let's see. For the creativity, you should get a point. Where shall I put it here? I don't know where to put it, but I'm not going to give you the answer because that was good. Where else? What else? Still missing some pretty significant things. Including number one, right? Including number one. Clothes and fabrics. Clothes and fabrics. Nah. Okay, let's go down to number 10. I think we already said, no, we didn't say this one. Beverage bottles made of glass. Number nine, beverage cans. Take out and take away containers. Number seven, it's a biggie and a personal pet peeve of mine. Straws and stirrers. Oh, yeah. Use these things for seconds. And you know how easy it is when you go into a restaurant and you order your drink and you say, I'll have an iced tea, unsweetened, extra lemon, no straw. Super easy to do. And when that serving person pushes a straw at you anyway, you remind them again so they hear it over and over and over. If you go to Miami Metro Zoo or you go to the Sequarium, they don't even have straws in those places. Why? Because they're dangerous for the animals. But apparently as soon as
as you leave the zoo, we don't care about the animals anymore. Mm -hmm. But so it's it's a really good reason. Super easy to eliminate from your life. Grocery bags number six, bottle caps, just loose caps, number five on the list. Masks and such, food wrappers and candy, beverage bottles of plastic. Number one, one last chance. Oh, you, that might be it. Cigarettes. Cigarette. Oh, oh, yeah. yes. oh wow. <laughs> 964,521 cigarette butts in three hours. Wow. Unbelievable, huh? Unbelievable. So what does it matter? Who cares? Let's take a look at some of that. So this is bouncing around under the water. You know what that looks like if your brain is about the size of a ping pong ball? Jellyfish. A jelly. Who likes to eat jellies? You do. <laughs> you have a shell, sir? <laughs> turtles? Turtles love to eat jelly. So imagine the turtle comes along and says, wow, really big jellyfish, dude. It works and it works and it works and it works finally gets it down into a tiny little ball that it's able to swallow where it gets stuck somewhere in here. And we find sea turtles all clogged up with plastic bags in them. A little more innocuous here. Shoes and soles. Yeah. Soul survivor from a shipwreck. Yeah. I'm here all week. Yeah. <laughs> but don't look at what's here. Look at what's not here. Look at that little diamond shaped hole right there. Suppose this is floating at the top. Same turtle comes along and says, Wow, Portuguese man over up there. I'm going to eat that Portuguese man. Bites it and it folds in half. And now, no longer is it a diamond shaped hole, it's the exact shape of a turtle's beak. And then you look and you see bite, 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 partial bite. These little pieces of foam plastic, they are able to swallow. They don't clog them up. But they're unable to pass it. And so their stomach fills up with little bits of plastic. And what do you stop doing when your stomach is full? Stop eating. Eating. Stop eating. We find sea turtles washed in that are completely emaciated, starved to death with plastic-filled stomachs. One more, and this would be sort of humorous if it weren't so sad. Y'all know about hermit crabs? Hermit crabs don't have a shell of their own. They rely on finding a shell made by a snail to move into. But people like to collect shells. So how sad is it when it's easier to find a plastic champagne bottle top on the shoreline than to find a shell to move into? It's sort of funny to see a plastic bottle top walking along the shoreline. And then you realize it's no more funny than somebody living in a cardboard box in downtown Miami, right? It's just not supposed to be that way. So hopefully lots of good examples for why it's really important to hold on to your stuff, right? If you're picnicking at the beach, by a river, in a forest, in a desert, on the mountaintop, wherever you are, and that something goes blowing away and you say, ah, oh, too hard to get. I promise you it's not. Go get it. It matters. It really does. Sometimes the stuff that washes in on Biscayne National Park shorelines is just downright weird. Really weird. Like, I don't even know what that thing is it? weird. What's that? Do we want to see oh, it? yeah, it's pretty cool. I found this, I don't remember how long ago. We got a magnificent frigate bird putting on quite a show back here, huh? <laughs> they are pretty cool birds. Um, one of the coolest words in the English language describes this bird. It is a kleptoparasite. <laughs> You know what that is? It steals other people's lunch. Steals <laughs> other people's lunch or other birds' lunch. So, yeah. yeah, with those long wings, they are so maneuverable that one of these smaller birds that keeps flying by, if they get a fish, he doesn't want to get his wings wet because he would have a hard time taking off again if, and flying if he did. So, he chases that bird mercilessly until it drops that fish. And before the fish hits the water, it swoops down, grabs it out of midair has its lunch. So it's stealing from other birds. A kleptoparasite. Cool bird, huh? <laughs> I found this probably, I don't even remember, 30 years ago. And not knowing what it was did not stop me from keeping it. 
I kept it and it took me many years to finally learn what it was someone told me. So I'm not going to tell you what it is either. I'm going to pass it around. If you know what it is, hold that to yourself and we will get back to it. Okay? You have a guess? Okay, we'll get to it. I promise. We're gonna, in the meanwhile, we're going to talk about a few other things here. Like this thing. Anybody know what that is? Some kind of sea sponge. Sponge, just sort of bouncy like a sponge, but it's not a sponge. Nope. Is that oh, looks like cardboard. 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 It is not cardboard. It's a little more rigid than that. Yeah. It's a shedding from a sea snake. Ooh, like a, a, a an exo skin, like yeah. a, like a snake that sheds and it peeled off its skin, but it's from a sea snake. No, not that. Anybody been to Hawaii? It's a lake. No. <laughs> this mess. Scallop potato. Does kind of look like a scallop potato there. I went to the South Florida Fair up in West Palm Beach a number of years ago and I went to one of those booths out on the midway where they had like things like four-headed turtles and two-headed sheep and <laughs> that kind of stuff. They had one of these in the drawer there and it was labeled as a Mongolian death worm. <laughs> it is what not is a it? Mongolian death worm. That's what we're trying to figure out. Any guesses? It's not a sponge, it's not a snake skin, it's not a lay, and it's not a Mongolian death worm. Rattles. Is it, is, it a, is it a natural object? Or it is a natural object. Natural object. Seeds in it though. Seeds. Good guess, but no seeds. <laughs> Good guess. But it rattles. It does rattle. So you can see it's kind of like a twisting cord, right? And there's little chambers along that cord. Each of those chambers contains anywhere from 50 to 150 eggs. This is the egg case from a whelk, which is a very large snail. Now those little tiny eggs hatch out while they are still in there. And the first ones that hatch out are insanely hungry. What is the most convenient thing to eat? Your brothers. Your brothers and sisters, indeed. Once you've eaten your family, you chew your way out and you bury yourself as quickly as possible because pretty much everything else in the ocean wants to eat you at that point. If you are incredibly, incredibly lucky, you might get to be a snail about this big where you can make one of these yourself. And ideally, it will wrap around a piece of coral or seagrass like that and it will stay underwater for the entirety of that um, hatching process and will not end up in a box owned by a heart <laughs> crane. <laughs> so this is the egg case from a very large snail called a whelk. Here's a weird object. Remember what I said to you earlier about some of my questions being ridiculously <laughs> easy? Do not overthink this. <laughs> this is a... Rock. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is a rock. But this rock is really unusual. What's the first thing you notice when I drop this rock into your hand? Light. It's light. It is so light, in fact, that if I were to toss it out into the harbor out there, it would float. And where do we get floating rocks from? Volcanoes. Volcanoes. Now, it's a pretty clear day. Do you see this boat right in front of the building? Look straight up from that boat out on the horizon there. Can you see the volcano? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no volcano. That is messy. But where where is the nearest volcano? It's a dry cucumber. Hawaii? There's volcano. We went to one in New Mexico. Yeah? Capulin Volcano? Yeah, a national park. Closer than New Mexico. There's one going off in Hawaii right now, yeah. right? But closer oh, than Hawaii. <laughs> Where else? I saw one in Italy not too long ago called Stromboli. I always thought Stromboli was something you ate at the Italian <laughs> restaurant. Yeah, Japan has Japan's on the Pacific. Yeah, Japan does have volcanoes, but closer than that. Where? 
Yellowstone, but that's yeah. farther than New Mexico. Yeah. Sure. In the Caribbean are lots of volcanic islands. Um, Montserrat okay. is still steaming after an eruption 20 plus years ago. St. Vincent's went off not too long ago. St. Lucia has volcanic activity, lots of volcanoes. So when that lava first comes out, it's light and fluffy like that, and it hits the water, it cools so quickly that the air bubbles get trapped on the inside. And then as it rolls around through the waves, it smooths out, and we get these things washing in. And this has a special name. We have a name for this type of rock. What is it? Pumice. Pumice. What do you use pumice for? Uh, scrubbing. Scrubbing. Calluses and things like that, right? They used to grind it up and add it to toothpaste as an abrasive. Um, <laughs> All kinds of uses for it. Levi Strauss Corporation, interestingly, had a pumice mine just south of Grand Canyon National Park in the San Francisco Peaks area until the Hopi people said, we want our sacred mountains back. Why did <laughs> Levi Strauss want pumice? Aged jeans. Stonewashed, stonewashed oh, jeans, right? Stonewashed. None of us are wearing stonewashed jeans right now, so <laughs> fashion changes, and that, has, that benefits sometimes, right? Um, so, there you go. One of the people who lived out on that island, just to the south of that opening that's above the, the markers here, was Russell Needhawk. And he found a big piece out there on the island one time. And he put a hole in the middle of it, and he rigged it up to a foot treadle grinding wheel so he could pump his foot and it would spin. And that's how they would grind things down on Elliott Key in the 1930s. So he uh, talks about, or his wife Charlotte talks about getting a conch shell, like we started with earlier and how he t cut the top off and smoothed the edges with the grinding wheel. And it was a grinding wheel made out of pumice out there. So we get pumice washing. And where's our weird object? Can I have that back? The other weird object. <laughs> we have many weird objects. <laughs> oh, yeah. What is this? You said you have a guess. If you think you know, hold on for a second. Let some other guesses come out. Oh, an embryonic sack of some sort. <laughs> yeah, it's, no, it's not. It's like kind of <laughs> what you got? A potato skin. A potato skin! No. <laughs> a shark egg. So sharks that lay eggs have a thing that's sometimes called a mermaid's purse something like that and it's kind of <laughs> like this it's got that feel to it but this is not a good guess yeah, though I like that, that. just based on appearance what does it kind of look like tooth. a tooth. tooth a lot of people say it looks like two roots from a tooth there long. it's not look like long. Look like a, a long yeah. oh like a set of lungs <laughs> no. you are the closest really? yes <laughs> Tissue. It is an organ. Oh. A heart. Bladder. A heart? It is a bladder. Oh. What kind oh. of bladder? Shark. Nope. Touch that. <laughs> In fact, Touch sharks that? do not have this Ooh, kind of bladder okay. because sharks have so much oil in their liver that they don't need this. That's how they keep afloat. But other kinds of this general category of organisms does have a fish swim bladder. This is how fish maintain their buoyancy underwater. It is a muscular organ. You can see the striations on there of all those muscles, right? It's filled with gas. When you squeeze that muscle down, there's less gas in your body, and what happens to you? You sink. When you expand, and there's more gas in your body, you come no, floating no, up. <laughs> oh, I never did come back to you, I'm sorry. I'm glad I went less. <laughs> What were you gonna guess? Tell us, tell well, us. Well, from a distance, it looked like a chrysalis of some Does. sort. Yeah, that's another common guess: is a chrysalis. But or then, a when I got it close and held yeah. it, it kind of looked like an apple skin, or a potato skin, or a potato skin. <laughs> so, yeah. So this is an organ. This is how fish maintain their points. Next time, you are able to look at live fish in an aquarium or out on a reef. Watch what they're doing. They're not swimming. They're just sitting there. Right? I saw, saw the tentacles. They're just sitting there. Just they like just sit, On right? top of the water, they're just, there's like tentacles. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. 
you try and do that next time you're in a swimming pool, I want you to submerge yourself halfway between the top and bottom and in the middle of the pool, and you don't do any of this stuff, and see if you can do it. You can't, because you don't have a swim bladder. But, I will grant you, by the way, that is, that is not much of a gift from the sea. It's a skanky old organ, right? But, not all gifts have to be something tangible that you can touch and feel. I'm going to wait for the Air Force to finish their maneuvers. <laughs> Do you know the Air Force calls us every morning and says, what time will Gary be speaking today? Because that's when we're going to fly over every day. So, um, I forgot where I was. Swim bladders. Swim bladders, Trans yeah. Skanky um, old. Skanky old or not all, thank you, um, not all gifts have to be something tangible. Sometimes the gift is an idea. And there is an idea that was born of this. Any scuba divers here? What is this like? Uh, buoyancy. Uh, a buoyancy compensation device, or a BC, or BCD. So, when people first started scuba diving, they said, Dang, I keep crashing into the bottom, or I keep shooting to the top and giving myself the bend. How are the fish doing this? And they created an external swim bladder, a vest that you can add air to when you want to float higher, or release air from when you want to sink lower. This is how we all, when we scuba dive, explore the underwater world. And it started with an idea that we got from nature. You know, there's an awful lot of people in that giant city over there in South Florida who arrived here in the exact same way that the items we've been passing around arrived here. They too came floating in from other places. I have some photographs here of this very little harbor right here back in the summer of 1994 when that little harbor was plum chock full of little homemade boats that came over from Cuba. Now I'll pass this around in a second, but look at the ingenuity on these boats. Look at the boats made out of inner tubes. Look at the boats made out of 55 gallon drums. Look at the boats made out of old dock foam. I have seen boats made out of one gallon Wesson oil containers. You collect enough of those and you strap them together, you've got a floating platform. There was even someone who took an old Buick and welded the doors shut, sealed up the bottom, and they drove over from Cuba. <laughs> Some pretty impressive stuff. My all-time <coughs> favorite of all the rafts I've ever seen here at Biscayne National Park is this one. And it was my favorite for two reasons. First, it was an amazing piece of engineering. And the pictures don't do it justice, so I'll describe it to you. It was five great big tractor inner tubes. So imagine one here, two here and two here so already the boat has a or the, the air thing has a boat like shape to it right and then they had what to me appeared like an old awning of some sort a piece of heavy plastic like fabric that they custom fit and had a sewing machine that could stitch it to fit custom around those tires to hold it up they took galvanized fence posts and bent them so that it fit around and strapped the gunnel onto that. Down at the bottom, there's a two by 10 board, two by eight board that was used as a keel. The ore that we found on this was also a galvanized fence post with a two by 10 board welded or um, bolted onto the bottom. Nice lightweight paddle for those of you that paddle, right? Um, it was amazing. The other reason that it's one of my favorite rafts of all time is because most people who are escaping a communist regime or poverty or devastation of an earthquake or whatever do not have the presence of mind to name their boat. And these guys did. And they did it with a sense of humor. Up top, El Missile. The Missile. This is not the first time missiles were aimed at the United States or Cuba. Down below, Los Rabidos de Mina which translates to the fast ones from Mina. I had never heard of Mina, so I pulled out one of those books that has all the maps in it that we used to use before we had phones, called an atlas. 
and I found the Cuba page, and I went painstakingly along the coast until sure enough, right there on the uh, north coast of Cuba was a little town called Mina, presumably where they set off from. So what would you bring with you if you were to make such a journey? Water. I told you my questions aren't always hard. <laughs> Water. <laughs> usually the usually <laughs> the largest or the most numerous container on any of these boats is a water container of some sort. Mm. What else do you have to have? Food. Food. Usually little canapes and pedophores made of watercress with the small <laughs> rust cut off. <laughs> no. You find a lot of protein bars and things like that. If you can't afford protein bars, what we often find look like bricks made out of tin foil and if you open it up it's beef fat melted with peanut butter super rich and fat and full of calories in a very compact way looks gross but there you go what if you ran out of food what could you do eat your brothers eat your brothers and sisters <laughs> yeah. what else could you do fish, fish. so we find uh, fishing equipment like this Cuban yo-yo on uh, on the ships there. That's got hooks on it, so I'm not going to pass it around. What else would you bring with you? Some shelter. Something to protect you from the sun, right? So we find umbrellas, we find tarps, we find long sleeves in the middle of summer, we find sunscreen bottles, anything to protect you from that beating, beating sun for sure. What else? Maybe a little something to make you forget where you are? Looks like it ought to be in a display case at Williamsburg, huh? <laughs> like pretty impressive. And then you notice it's all black around the top. So all these years later, I can still smell the kerosene that was in here. This was a light source. Not the light source I would have chosen on a tiny little boat <laughs> in the middle of the ocean, but there you go. What else? There's something really important that we're forgetting again. You are leaving everything you have ever known. Pictures? Or? Pictures. The saddest thing I've ever found on any one of these boats was a wedding album. But suddenly, this was no longer a pile of floating trash. These people had faces. And I knew what they looked like. And I knew that if they had made it safely, they would have taken that album. For some people, a little divine guidance. Yeah, so you find Bibles and things like that. This is just a prayer card. It's an interesting one, because it's got three guys in a boat. The seas are very rough. There's clouds, there's lightning. They look very afraid. And it says at the bottom, Nuestra Señora de la Caridad Patrona de Cuba, which is Our Lady of Charity, the Patroness of Cuba. And if you open it up, it tells you the whole story about how in the year 1620, these guys went out fishing in a boat, seas got rough, weather got bad, they got very afraid, they prayed for deliverance. Our Lady of Charity appeared in the heavens, seas were calm, they made it back safely, and she became the patroness of Cuba. All that is well and good. What I find most interesting about that story on the inside there is where they came from. They came from a tiny little town on the north coast of Cuba called Mina. And this came from that very boat that was from me. So there was some precedent for people getting to where they were expected to go. Freedom is a pretty big gift, no? What's bigger? Health. Health. Life itself, huh? Life itself. I wonder if you all know what this critter is, was. Of course you crap. Horseshoe crab. Not really a crab at all, although it's got lots of pinchy little legs under there that make it look like a crab. It's more closely related to spiders. The horseshoe part comes from that shape right there. Um, ancient critters, been around forever and ever and ever and ever. Um, and, and they're cool to look at, right? You look at it there and you see, oh look, there's an eye there and there's an eye there. But in actuality, if you looked at it under a microscope, you would see that those eyes are compound eyes, like the eyes of a fly. So thousands of eyes right there. And then they've got another little pair of eyes right down here on this little bump over here. So eyes there. 
They have light sensing organs going all the way down their tail here. So they have eyes on their tail. They got eyes all over the place. If you were to open up this animal when it was alive, its blood would not be red like ours and so many other animals. Its blood is blue. 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 Sky blue. Because it's based on copper, not on iron, the way ours is. And it turns out, and you know, hey, you ever listen to like National Public Radio or something, and you're listening along, and you hear about some great new scientific discovery, and you go, now how the heck did they figure that out, right? This is the story of this for me, and I've invented a story in my head to go with it. I was sitting in my lab one day, and I happened to have a bucket of horseshoe crab blood sitting nearby, and I accidentally dropped some bacteria into it, and I noticed that the blood clotted instantly. And that's probably not the way it happened, but that's what happens. In the presence of a bacterial toxin, the blood of the horseshoe crab, a compound in the blood, clots instantly. This is the primary test in the world today, for it's the only test in the world today, for testing for impurities in injectable drugs, artificial joints. Anything that's gonna go into you is tested for purity. Flu vaccine, the development of the COVID vaccine, critically, critically influenced by this animal right here. And they're just crawling around right here on the, on the bottom of the bay with pelicans flying overhead. Here's uh, one of the animals that a lot of people come to Biscayne National Park to see. Um, less so at this time of year because our weather tends to be pretty bad. It broke some time ago, but this is coral, specifically staghorn coral, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. And um, staghorn coral is, this is the skeleton of the staghorn coral, which is made of calcium carbonate, or what most of us call limestone. Some scientists in California some time ago figured out that if you take calcium carbonate and you treat it chemically in just the right way, you can change it. No longer is it calcium carbonate, it's calcium phosphate. Do you know of anything that is made predominantly of calcium phosphate that allows me to stand in front of you today? Bones. 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 Mostly calcium phosphate. So let's envision another scenario where something really awful happened. You're in a car accident. You break your back. Your surgeon has three choices. They're gonna have to fuse some of your vertebrae together to stabilize. So your surgeon has three choices. She can go into your hip and take a bone from there. That means two surgeries. That's not always the best choice, right? You could go to a cadaver, someone who's donated their bone for just such an occasion. Um, there's chances of rejection or you could take a piece of coral that has been transformed into calcium phosphate and your doctor can shape it and carve it into just the right shape needed to insert in between those two vertebrae. The holes where the animal used to live still exist there so your own blood vessels can grow through. Your own body then starts to deposit calcium on top of that as a scaffolding for your body to heal itself. If any of you have ever had dental surgery where there had to be some reconstruction on your jaw, there's a really, really high chance you have coral in your mouth right now, or at least something that was grown. And, and that's a good point because, you know, coral's having a hard time of it all over the world. You don't want to take coral out of the wild and, uh, and then, you know, ruin that out there. So they've actually found ways to start growing coral in laboratories. Not only are they growing coral in laboratories, they're growing it in the right shapes so that you know you can go on to Amazon for doctors or whatever and order like a finger digit. I need a pinky digit from a left hand of a 45 year old guy. I don't know how that works, but um, yeah, it could grow, grow it in just the right shape. Pretty amazing stuff. So we have coral. I started with a shell, so I'm gonna end with a shell. This one is quite a bit smaller than the one we started with, but it's got a really cool name based on its appearance. <laughs> It looks like a little tiny ice cream. Yes. <laughs> ice cream cone. Ice cream cone. This is a cone snail. And this specific cone snail with these markings, because it looks like little lines of writing on there, is called the alphabet cone. <laughs> this is one of the coolest animals in Biscayne National Park. 
I know people want to see the manatees and the sharks and the crocodiles and the dolphins and the blah, blah, blah. These guys are super, super cool. So like that big snail we started with, it will rest on the bottom. It will have one little eye stalk coming out there, one little eye stalk coming out there. And what's in the middle? Mouth. A mouth, a tubular shaped mouth. Except in this one, the tubular shaped mouth is not so little. It's at least as long as its body, and maybe twice as long. <laughs> and so when this little snail is on the bottom, in the seagrass, with its little mouth part waving up here, you know what that looks like? A worm. And you know what likes to eat worms? Bigger worms. <laughs> so that bigger worm comes along and says, oh yeah, there's lunch over there. Starts making its way over. And just before it chomps down into that little worm, out of the end of this tube comes a harpoon filled with venom <laughs> that shoots directly into that worm, killing it instantly. And because it's a harpoon, it's still attached, so it slowly pulls it in and has lunch. Now, in the South Pacific, there are cone snails that are about this big, and those are the ones that hunt fish. A snail that can hunt a fish is pretty darn impressive, I think. What else is really impressive is up in Boca Raton, Florida, at Florida Atlantic University, there is a cone snail toxin research center where they have discovered that administered properly and in the right dosages, cone snail toxin is 500 times more powerful than morphine as a painkiller. And here's the kicker for a world addicted to opiates, non So I don't know where that stands. Um, they don't let park rangers know such things, but um, there you go, crawling around on the bottom. I wish that I could put into this box all of the gifts that I have gotten from this place over the past 36 years. I wish I could put in there the sunrises, the sunsets. I wish I could put in there the flat, calm summer days when zooming across this bay on a boat is like flying because that water is so clear it can't possibly even be there. I wish I could put in there the days like we're going to have in a few days where the white waves are going to be biting like teeth at a black sky. I wish I could put in there the dolphins leaping out of the water, flipping two times in the air and landing back in. That's not just at SeaWorld. It really happens here. I wish I could put in there the day it was the middle of summer. I was walking up this ramp. It was pouring rain. It was hot. It was buggy. It was miserable. There was not a car in the parking lot that didn't belong to an employee. There was nobody here. And I walked up that ramp and I looked into the harbor right there and I saw a manatee. Not unusual. We see manatees all the time. But this manatee was acting really weird. This manatee put its head out of the water and its tail out of the water and then the middle of its back and then the head and the tail in the middle of its back. And I stood right over here near where Grant's sitting and I watched for a while trying to figure out what was going on. Was it hurt? Was it injured? What's going on? And then I realized there was another manatee underneath. And I said, I know what they're doing. <laughs> so I went and got my coworkers because how often do you get to watch that? And we all lined up along this railing and it wasn't very long before I realized I was right. They were making more manatees because now there were she was giving birth. First time I ever learned that one manatee will use another manatee as a doula or a midwife or a cheerleader or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> we watched as that itty bitty tiny little black baby, only this guy, I never saw a black manatee before. I thought they always were gray and slimy, but when they're fresh and new, they're black. I watched as that mom got beneath it and pushed it to the surface for its first breath got on top of it and pushed it down, got below it, pushed it up three times. You could almost hear the little baby saying, cool, that's what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? And then we watched as it took its first meal from under her flipper. And a couple hours later, we watched as they both swam out of the harbor here together. I get to see these things because this is my special place. This is the place I love more than any other on this planet. I get that if you are only here for a short visit, you might not feel the 
the way I feel about this place. And that's okay. Because I bet you have a place that is as special to you as this place is to me. It might be another national park. It might be what you see through a telescope when you look into a night sky. It might be your garden. It might be the window where you do the dishes and you can see the bird feeder out your window. Whatever that place is for you, I hope you recognize, especially in this season of giving, what an extraordinary gift that place is. Thanks for your time. If you joined us a little late and you're curious about some of the things that we passed around, please don't hesitate to ask. I am more than happy to, to go through some of those things with you. Thank you very, very you're much. You're welcome. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Thank you. Where are you guys visiting from? Montana. Montana? Where? <coughs> very it's cool. 25 below there, right? This <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. How about y'all? Fort Lauderdale. All the way. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I live in Wilton Manor, so I know all oh, the way. Okay. I know what that means. <laughs>